I'm professional photographer and photography instructor Nick Carver. The following video presentation is a free sample from my Introduction to DSLR Photography online course. Now this is just one of seven video presentations on this course, totaling 94 minutes in all. The course also includes six in-depth weekly lesson guides, one of which can be downloaded for free on my website. So if you like what you see here, remember that this is just a tiny sampling of what's included on the full course. If you'd like more information about this course and to download more free samples, please visit my website at nickcarverphotography.com slash online courses. Thanks for watching and enjoy the video. Hi again and welcome to the fourth video presentation of your Introduction to DSLR Photography online course. And this week we're talking all about shutter speed. So let's take a look. Now just to recap what we covered in week two of this course, uh, we had our three exposure tools in your camera. That's the shutter measured by the shutter speed, the aperture measured by the f-stop or the f-number, and the sensor measured by the ISO. So you have your shutter speed, your aperture, and your ISO. Now next week we'll be addressing the f-numbers and the aperture. The week after that we'll be talking about ISO, but this week we're talking about shutter speed. And as you just went through your lesson guide there, we learned about how it affects motion and how it affects light. So we're going to summarize that in the video presentation here. So let's take a look at shutter speed. So again, the shutter is just a curtain that allows light to hit the sensor. Basically blocks the sensor at all times and then moves out of the way when the camera's ready to take a photo so that it can start collecting light. Now however long that curtain's open for is the shutter speed and that's measured in time. So it could be fractions of a second, multiple seconds, multiple minutes, even multiple hours. The longest photo I've ever taken is 30 minutes the longest photo I've ever seen online is 11 hours. But however long that shutter's up for is a factor of time and it's the shutter speed. So it's no different than a stopwatch. And if we look at an older style camera like this, modern day digital cameras won't really let you see the shutter uh, because they're all sealed up in the back. But if we open up the back of this older film camera, we'll be able to take a look at the shutter from behind. So here's the shutter right here, these little blades right here. And this is where the sensor would be. So you're basically looking where the sensor would be sitting. Now I'm going to dial in a shutter speed of one second. So here we're going to dial it in. And when I take the photo, you're going to see it'll be open for one one thousand done. So it's open for exactly one second. Now on your camera, that would be displayed as one quotes. That's what one second looks like. Now I'm going to dial in a fraction of a second. This is going to be one fifteenth of a second. Now the curtain will be open for a much shorter time period now. There we go. Up and right back down. Now I'll dial in hundredths of a second. So this is uh, 1 over 250. 1 two fiftieth of a second. So fast you can't even see it move. And these cameras can even go up into the thousandths of a second. Now in daily life, we think of one second as being pretty fast. But in photography, that's an eternity. The vast majority of your photos will be in fractions of a second, like hundredths or thousandths, uh, unless you're on a tripod, in which case you can get into multiple seconds. Now most cameras can be open anywhere from one four thousandth of a second to 30 seconds, and it can be longer with special settings shooting in full manual, but we won't be addressing those in this course because you'll very rarely, if ever, have to go beyond 30 seconds. I've been shooting a long time, and I've only had to get beyond 30 seconds maybe half a dozen time, uh, half a dozen times in my years of shooting, so I don't think you'll be using it very often. One four thousandth of a second to 30 seconds is more than sufficient for what you'll have to do. Some cameras go up to one eight thousandth of a second. If yours doesn't, no big deal. You're not missing much, believe me. You'll very rarely, if ever, have to go above one four thousandth. Now longer shutter speeds let in more light, and that's the whole point. That's why the shutter was invented, and that's what it's supposed to do. So in dimmer environments, the shutter will have to stay open longer in order to let in enough of that dim lighting. In bright environments, it can be open for a shorter time period so as to not let in too much light. Now that's why the shutter speed exists. It's there to let in more or less light. But it also happens to affect motion blur. So since it's a factor of time, whatever motion occurs during that time period is going to show up as blur in the photo. So the shutter speed's basically affecting two things. It's affecting light and it's affecting motion blur. Now as we learned previously in this course, the fact that it affects light 
the fact that it lets in more or less light is not necessarily a big issue because oftentimes the aperture and the ISO can cancel it out. In other words, if you let in more light with the shutter, it doesn't necessarily mean your picture is going to be brighter. The aperture and the ISO may cancel it out. But in dark environments, you're going to have to use longer shutters because that's the only way to get enough light in. In brighter environments, you're going to have to use faster shutter speeds, otherwise the camera will soak up too much light. But you'll want to pay very close attention to how it affects motion blur anytime you're shooting, uh, shooting a moving subject. And that includes if you're hand holding the camera, because then you're a moving subject. So let's take a look at your shutter speeds here. We have 30 seconds all the way down to 1 4,000th. Now 30 seconds on your camera would be represented by 30 quotes. The quotes on the display indicates full seconds. And down at 30 seconds, we have a very long shutter speed, which lets in a lot of light. A ton of light can get in at 30 seconds because that's a very long time period for the camera to soak it up. That also blurs motion a lot. A lot of motion can occur in 30 seconds, so when you're down to those longer shutter speeds in multiple seconds, you get a lot of motion blur and it's very hard to get a moving subject sharp. Now up at 1 4,000th we have a fast shutter speed and that lets in very little light. The camera doesn't have a lot of time to soak up light in 1 4,000th of a second so it doesn't let in very much. That's also going to freeze motion really well. So that's good for photographing things like hummingbirds and wildlife and sports. Things where you want to freeze the action of a fast moving subject, you'll need these faster shutter speeds. But keep in mind that they're not going to let in nearly as much light, so you got to have a lot of it available. Now we'll take a look at how it affects motion here. So this windmill's spinning around, but I'm not moving. I'm on a tripod in these photos, so as I slow the shutter speed down, you're going to see how it affects the motion of the windmill. So I'm at 1 200th of a second. That's pretty fast. Fast enough to freeze the blades on this windmill as they spin around. But I'm going to slow it down. Slow it down to 1 50th, and we start to get a little bit of blur around the edges, but not all that much. I'll slow it down again to 1 13th. Now we're getting a lot more blur around the blades as they have more time to move during the photo, so they end up leaving a streak. I'll slow that 1 13th down all the way to 1 3rd of a second. Now we get a lot more blur. The windmill has even more time to move, so it leaves more streak. And I'll slow it all the way down to two and a half seconds. That's a very long time period. It's a full two and a half seconds this windmill has uh, to spin around, so we get a lot of blur here, and it looks like it's going really fast. So going from the original shutter speed of 1 200th to two and a half seconds, we're getting a much longer shutter speed and much more pronounced blur. Now keep in mind too that this longer shutter speed is letting in a lot more light than the previous 1 200th. It's letting in a lot more light and yet the picture's not any brighter. Because remember that when you let in more light with the shutter, it can be canceled out by the aperture and the ISO, and sometimes even a filter. So the fact that your shutter speed is long and it's letting in a bunch of light doesn't necessarily mean your picture will be bright it can be canceled out by the shutter and the aperture. I'm sorry, the aperture and the ISO. Has a good effect on uh, moving water, so anytime you're photographing a waterfall, uh, controlling the shutter speed can be a, a beneficial thing for your photo. We'll start at 1 80th of a second here. Freezes the water pretty well. We see a lot of the water droplets. I'll slow it down to 1 20th of a second. We start to get a little bit of streak here. I'll slow it down again to 1 5th. We get more streak. I'll slow it down again to 0.8 seconds, even more streak to the water. And then all the way to 3.2 seconds. So that's a very long exposure and there's no way you can hold that still without the help of a tripod. <clears throat> but this longer shutter speed creates that kind of misty, silky effect to the water that everyone wants to do. Now, going from the original exposure of 1 80th of a second to 3.2 seconds, I'm letting in a lot more light again. So the picture doesn't get any brighter because the camera automatically let in less light with the aperture and the ISO. Now if I want to use these really long shutter speeds to blur water like this, I can't do it in a bright environment. It simply lets in too much light. Sometimes the aperture and the ISO can't compensate enough for how much light this is letting in. I've taught people this trick quite often to get blurry water like this and they think, oh I want to do that. So they go out at high noon plug in a long shutter speed of a couple of seconds and photograph a waterfall and the picture just blows out white. And the problem is that they were out there at high noon. 
that's too bright of a light source. You can really only use these long shutter speeds, which let in a ton of light. You can only do them in the deep shade on an overcast day after sunset. It has to be darker conditions. Now in the thousands of hours I've been teaching photography, I've only had one student tell me that this one looks better, the one with the faster shutter speed. Almost everybody likes that look better. So that's a desirable thing to do on waterfalls. It's a great way to make your landscape shots and your waterfall photos kind of stand out a little bit more and look a little more professional. Uh, looks great on fountains too, like in a pool or a uh, fountain at a house or something like that. Those long shutter speeds, it's that easy. You just need to get onto a tripod. That's the main thing because nobody's holding the camera perfectly still for 3.2 seconds, not even me. So let's look at some real life examples. We have a fast shutter speed here at 1 8,000th of a second. That freezes something well beyond the human eye we can never see. Uh, but 1 8,000th of a second doesn't let in hardly any light. So that had to be done in a very bright situation. I was in a studio with a bunch of flashes that were just pouring light onto this water droplet. 1 uh, 3200th of a second here freezes some sports. And again, it's a fast shutter speed, which is freezing the action really well but it's also not letting in very much light. So I had to do this in the middle of the day. If I tried to do this in the evening, I wouldn't be able to use that fast of a shutter speed. It wouldn't let in enough light. 1 800th of a second here on this bird. Now this bird isn't moving all that fast. He's coming in for a slow landing. So 1 800th of a second was plenty fast to freeze him. Now if he was a hummingbird, 1 800th of a second wouldn't do it. I would need something more like 1 4,000th. So the faster the subject is moving, the faster the shutter speed needs to be in order to freeze it. Here we have a shutter speed of 1 200th. Now my model here isn't moving that much, she's sitting still. I'm not moving that much, I'm hand holding but I'm pretty steady. So 1 200th of a second is more than enough to freeze any little motions we have. Here on this landscape I have 1 20th of a second. Now nothing is moving uh, in this photo all that much. So 1 20th of a second is fast enough to freeze what little bit of motion there is. Which the only motion there is is from the flowers moving in the breeze a little bit. So they're not moving real fast, they're not exactly a hummingbird's wings. But 1 20th of a second was necessary just to freeze what little bit of motion they had. And I was on a tripod here so my motion wasn't a concern at all. Now 1 5th of a second here down at the beach gives a great effect to the water. It slows it down just enough to soften it up, makes it a little more pleasing, but it's not so slow that the water disappears. Uh, when you're down at the beach and you use exposures of, say, five seconds and longer, the water moves so much that it kind of turns into this indiscernible fog, and you can't even tell what it is. It can look cool if you have a lot of rocks uh, displaced around the water, but if it's just on an open expanse like this, it actually doesn't look good because the water loses its shape so much it doesn't even look like the ocean anymore. Now waterfalls, multiple seconds looks awesome. About one second or longer will start to give you this nice silky cottony effect to the water. Uh, so again, you can't have too much light available because that shutter speed is letting in a bunch of light. And if you let in too much light, the picture is just going to blow out white. Here's a picture of the ocean at multiple seconds, 10 seconds. That's a very long exposure. So I get the water turning into kind of a fog like that. And it gets this nice misty effect as it goes around the, uh, the rocks there. Now, this was done in very dark conditions. This was right after sunset, and I'm actually in the shadow of a big cliff. So 10 seconds didn't let in too much light because the light was so dim. If I tried to do that long of an exposure in the middle of the day, again, the picture would just blow out white. The shutter speeds you want to use are not always the shutter speeds you can use. The light you're under dictates pretty heavily what shutter speeds will be available. Now when you're hand holding your camera, you need a shutter speed fast enough to freeze your camera shake. Now it's what shutter speed that is is not a specific number. In other words, it's not just 1 60th of a second and you'll be fine. Anyone who tells you that is oversimplifying it. The shutter speed that's acceptable to hand hold your camera varies depending on how zoomed in you are. So the more you zoom in, the higher the shutter speed needs to be, the faster it needs to be in order to freeze your motion. Because when you zoom in, you magnify things. And one of the things you magnify, other than your subject, is you magnify your own motion. 
So you'll need faster shutter speeds when you're using longer lenses. And the rule of thumb as described in the lesson guide is one over your lens focal length. So again, the lens focal length is the number on your lens that indicates how zoomed in it is. This lens, for instance, is a 50 millimeter lens. It says 50 millimeters right on the front. So in order to handhold with that lens, I would need a shutter speed at least one over 50. 150 if they're faster and I would be able to freeze my camera shake. So it's going to look something like this. If you're using a 25 millimeter lens, you need 1 25th of a second or faster. 50 millimeter lens, like we just said, 1 50th or faster. 1 100th of a second for a 100 millimeter lens or faster. 250 millimeter lens, you need 1 250th. So you get the idea. Just look at your lens, turn it into a fraction, and keep the shutter speed above that if you're going to handhold. That'll help eliminate blurry photos from camera shake. Um, now, if you have a zoom lens, the top end of the zoom lens may be 55 millimeters, and then the bottom end of the zoom lens may be, say, 18 millimeters. Well, wherever you zoom it to, you're going to have to still follow this rule. So if you zoom it to, say, 24 millimeters, you'll need at least 1 24th of a second. But then if you zoom in to 55, you'll need at least 1 over 55, which the closest would be 1 60th. Now, you can always go faster. That's a good thing if you can go faster. That just means you're gonna freeze your camera shake that much better. So for instance, if I'm using a 100 millimeter lens, I try and get it well above 1 100th, more like 1 250th or 1 200th. But if you follow this rule of thumb, you'll get a lot more sharp photos. So that's it for the shutter speed. Head on back to your weekly lesson guide to complete the assignment. I'll talk to you via email. And as always, if you have any questions, feel free to drop me a line at nc at nickcarverphotography.com.